African rhythms Passed down to us through ancient spirits Feel the spirit A unifying force Come on, move with the spirit From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University Welcome to Africa World Now Project I'm your host and producer, James Pope Today, postmodernist diversions of black rebellion. Africa World Now Project is next. We are witnessing a period that is trending towards unprecedented but it is not without genealogy or tradition. People around the world are engaged in public rebellion and protests as direct response and in solidarity with communities of African descent in the U.S. But the work, the spiritual, intellectual, and physical work, is not yet begun. Those who seek to counter this rebellion promote narratives in the media and with increased use of violence that tries to narrow the righteous rage to suggest that folk are responding to one instance of violence. They think that folk are rebelling against a video. They think that folk are just frustrated. They think that folks are responding to a, quote, bad apple, unquote. They think folks must protest peacefully. The they are those in positions of perceived power where thought and action are built upon racial capitalist logic that maintain and reinforce systems of dehumanization. There's a reality here, though. They don't truly think this. Quote, They, unquote, want you to think this. The Africana world is not simply frustrated, little children who have all the opportunity in the world, yet ungrateful, despite living in nations that are designed against one's very being. Folk are not responding to an instance of violence. People are instinctively responding to the structural and historical realities of violence that has in this moment articulated itself in disproportionate deaths from the current COVID-19 pandemic, massive unemployment, threats from fascist-leaning political officials and overtly racist groups that rival the slave patrols and Jim Crow lynch mobs, all while African-descended men and women are still being murdered by state-sanctioned use of force by highly militarized police on camera across the world. Least we do not forget that indigenous women are still disappearing, found murdered and sexually assaulted. It is essential in this moment where European modernity is fracturing for every critical thinking African and person of African descent globally to grab hold of the fracture and pull with all your might. Even more important, it is essential to gain clarity of objective and practice a sharpness of means. George Jackson wrote, we find ourselves today forced into a re-examination of the whole nature of black revolutionary consciousness and its relative standing within a class society. Indeed, the re-examination of the whole nature of black radical and revolutionary thought is critical in this moment. The answers that one will find, in fact, are rooted in an expanded idea of humanity, critiques of narrow notions of justice, answers that one will find lay at the very heart of the true practice of the very thing European modernity claims to have been built upon. But the problem with black radical and revolutionary consciousness is that it exposes the contradictions of these foundations. Political education then becomes the call of the day. In this regard, Fred Hampton provides a textured and sharp analysis of the role of political education in this re-examination. Fred Hampton argues, uh, you, you, Your Mo Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And I did it in the head thing. Yo, more talk like I said, well, uh, you know, you've been educated to uh, uh, hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother. I help you lead the revolution. Now I'm more pressure. Another example, Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face. But he moved all the white people out and he took over to be oppressed. Yeah, he did, causing no education. Oh, yeah. And the people that had been educated, they just said that we don't hate uh-huh. uh, white people, we hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. So we got to know your education program to find out what it's going to be in the finale. A lot of people uh-huh. were. Yomo Kenyatta is called not a never a revolutionary, but an ex revolutionary. So it's Papa Doc. They brought on a successful revolution. That thing in uh, the Mile Miles was a. Bantu freedom fighters, all that kind of action. But what we're saying is, that it's the end. That you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room could judge whether Castro's going to be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the stage they're in now, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. 
That's what we're talking about. Those are revolutionary. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people's thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism like you got in uh, Africa 9, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, be, you might get people caught up in the emotionless movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be, get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we'll have Negro imperialists. Education, political education, must be evident. And allow me to quickly point out, to be educated is to read. The revolutionary importance of reading is key. Reading, according to Paulo Fieri, is not exhausted merely by decoding the written word or written language, but rather anticipated by and extending into knowledge of the world. Reading the world precedes reading the word. And the subsequent reading of the word cannot dispense with continually reading the world. Language and reality are dynamically intertwined. The understanding attained by critical reading of a text implies perceiving the relationship between text and context. Therefore, our rebellious, ungovernable discourse must be rooted in a critical human rights consciousness, specifically a critical Africana human rights consciousness. It is here, the platform that guides the question, what next can be built? From this critical Africana human rights consciousness, we must engage in five activities. One, seek to institutionalize this moment, interrogating and building upon models and legacy of the Council of African Affairs, Organization of African American Unity, a black radical tradition trending trans Africa. Inject our energies in the vision as articulated by Vincent Harding in the Institute of the Black World. Two, develop ideological refinement for clarity towards objective. Three, all efforts must be linked with internationalism, pan-African being organizational goals. Four, consolidate written and non-written projects of black critique into a sustained counter discourse that provides response and self-critique. And five, this must consistently be rooted in a critical Africana human rights consciousness, which in itself is a critique and expansion of human rights theory and practice as currently organized. As we begin to move forward in next phases, we must move, in the words of Kwame Torre, our unconscious to conscious organized response. Above all, we must also keep in mind two important tactics offered by Amakal Cabral. One, those engaged in struggle should unflinchingly practice the notion of class suicide. And two, above all that is fought for and gained, every responsible member of a movement must have the carriage of his or her responsibilities, exacting from others a proper respect for his or her work and properly respecting the work of others. Hide nothing from the masses of our people. Tell no lies. Expose lies whenever they are told. Mask no difficulties, mistakes, failures. Claim no easy victories. It is in this historical genealogy we walk. It is in this ancestral tradition we live. It is here George Jackson provides more clarity. We must prove our predictions about the future with action. And I will add, within all expediency of black critique, as the future of our humanity rests on getting this right. Next, you will hear a conversation I recently had with Dr. Daryl B. Harris. Daryl B. Harris is an associate professor and former chair of political science at Howard University. In 2014-2015, he was recipient of a Fulbright Distinguished Research Award to Nigeria. The scholarly focus of his teaching and research is the philosophical underpinnings of black political phenomena. His work combines methods of Afrocological and political analysis with the goal of advancing Afrocentric understandings of the world. In exploring the fissures and nuances of previous critical works, Dr. Harris has found that the opening for innovation in the way we assess racial and cultural conflicts remains wide. He is author of The Logic of Black Rebellions, Postmodernist Diversions in African-American Thought, as well as various other chapters and articles. 
Daryl Harris has taught black politics and political theory courses at the University of Connecticut and is currently at Howard University, of which it has been since 2003. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Dr. Daryl Harris. How are you doing? Oh, very well. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, of course, um, we were talking off air and, you know, us being also, you know, friends and, and, and colleagues and also as full disclaimer, uh, you were uh, central to me doing my work at Howard University, particularly um, on my my dissertation committee. Um, but beyond that, we we have discussed and been you know, I guess, like intellectually engaging in discourses for years, uh, particularly around a lot of the issues that people are facing in the African world, particularly here in the United States, but also in relation to spiritual systems, cultural system, political systems on the continent of Africa. Today, this conversation is very important. Uh, today, the United States, but in Um, comparison, the world is responding to violence that has been inflicted upon people of African descent here in the United States, but also across the globe. People are protesting. uh, Things are being set on fire. I'm reminded of Dr. King and Harry Belafonte's uh, exchange about uh, leading people into the the burning house, as, as Harry Belafonte kind of remembered a conversation he once had with Dr. King towards the the end of his, um, his, his life here on earth. The burning house uh, notion is very important. We are living in a very, very extraordinary times, or times that I think that are very important to have a critical analysis of now, link with the past, but also really clear about where we're going in the future. Can you provide just a, a introductory statement or introductory thoughts um, before we engage in this conversation, or that can be the launching point for the conversation that we intend to have today, Dr. Harris? Well, what immediately comes to mind is the recent developments around the killing of George Floyd, but really uh, you had several high profile incidents, uh, one in Georgia with uh, Ahmed Ar- Arbery, uh, Brianna, I believe her last name is Taylor in Kentucky. Uh, on top of the coronavirus, on top of having really a psycho sociopathic <laughs> uh, leadership at the very top in the in the country, so I you know I, I have an interest in the um, black political expression as you know obviously that's my field, and so there are one thing to say there are so people can appreciate what's going on there are two types of political expression one type we generally call formal or systemic. These would be voting, running for office, those types of things. By the way, protests would be in there, that category, but it would be uh, what we call uh, non-disruptive. But what we witnessed over the past number of days is what we call informal or non-systemic um, type of political expression. These, these types are considered illegitimate or inappropriate. Uh, and so when people engage in them, that people frown on them and say, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be doing those types of things. These are the disruptive forms of political expression. They can range from uh, nonviolent sit-ins where they are disruptive of the normal order of the day, all the way to revolutionary violence. Uh, the, the key here is, is, is whether or not the protest is disruptive. So what we've been experiencing over the last couple of days is disruptive form of political expression. Uh, Obviously, uh, the term that I use is rebellion or uprising, as opposed to the loosely used term riot. And I do so because the term rebellion and uprising denote uh, political substance or that the, the people engaged in the expression have a political point that they're trying to articulate. And usually, two big reasons for why people would engage in informal types of political expression. One is if you are prohibited from using the formal expression, meaning you're locked out. Obviously, uh, much of Black political history has that experience of being locked out. 
But the other reason, and this is the one that seems to be most relevant uh, uh, in the current situation, is that is when you have been using the formal methods for years, it could be decades even, and you do not get the type of, uh, you, do, you do not generate satisfactory uh, policy results, then ultimately that could lead to people using informal expression. That's what we have here. Black people for years, decades, uh, um, voicing their concerns about police brutality, police killing, the abuse of police policing in black communities. And, and time and time again, black people being ignored. And uh, even with the videos that we see over the past decade, really, showing clearly what's going on and yet people get off. And I think this one, as they say, there's a, there's a cliche, uh, the last straw, if you will. It appears that this particular killing just really, really did it because of the manner in which uh, George Floyd was, was killed. So I would say that as an opening, if you will. No, that's it's important because, it, and actually you said a lot in there that, that could be unpacked. And then of course, you know, those who don't know, and I'll make links to this and, and put this in the bio and things, is that you wrote a book called The Logic of Black Urban Rebellions. And also one of the areas of research or areas that you are in are kind of evolved to is looking at this, this notion of a postmodernist uh, idea or the postmodernist versions in African-American thought. And we're going to get to that. But before we get to where your research has evolved and how timely and how relevant it is to understand the logic of Black urban rebellions or even Black rebellions and uprisings. You mentioned using uprisings and rebellions. We know right now that media, how it frames, or we can actually say how things are framed, the language, the ideas, the concepts that we use to frame our experiences are directly related to how we understand ourselves in relation to others, but also in relation to the past, present, and future, mm -hmm. right? Well, some people are calling it um, riots, but then you have an, an evolution, little bit of a discourse of people saying, being clear to say that, no, these are uprisings, or these are rebellions. So, Can you yeah, unpack yeah. that a little bit more? So, so, one, of the, so one of the, uh, and there's considerable, is a considerable literature, much of it from the 1960s, because that decade was a decade of, of black uprisings. And for example, if you just take, just to give, give people a picture of that decade, the 1960s, if you just take the year 1963 through 1968, roughly a five, five to six year period, there were, there were more than 300 rebellions that occurred over that, over that span of time in the United States, meaning practically every ma major metropolitan area experienced at least one some experience too. If you just take the summer, Martin Luther King was killed um, in 1960, April 4, 1968. If you just take that summer, the 1968 summer, there were 150 rebellions that occurred uh, that year. But on the question of rebellions, um, much of the literature, uh, some of the literature has, where well, there's a range of literature. So you have those who argue the riffraff argument, meaning uh, people are engaged in, in these expressions just for fun and profit, to, to, to loot uh, television sets and so forth. Uh, however, there is a literature that points to one, you can distinguish the, the course of the event based on the tar one of the uh, elements is tar targeted violence. So look at what black people targeted in, the, in these uprisings that have been happening over the last few days especially that first night in, Mil in, uh, in Minneapolis, for the first time in American history, a police station, a police station was targeted by the, uh, the rebels, if I, if I, I, as I called them, in this uprising. So there's a clear indication of the, the, them articulating their grievance on, on that night. Now, let me, let me say this very importantly, as it has evolved over the last number of days, this suspicion, that the protests being generated in all these cities is being sabotaged, that they're saboteurs, they're provocateurs, they're people dressed up in all black, jumping out of vans, painting on, spray painting buildings, Black Lives Matter. They look like 
white folk who are, they could be right wingers, they could be white supremacists, but they're sabotaging, they're sabotaging the, 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 some of these marches. I heard an exchange this morning, I was listening to the radio program this morning, a one black woman called in, she was part of a protest. There were some people who came to the protest, jumped out of the van, they were dressed in all black, jumped out of the van, started to spray paint a building. And she had a confrontation with, with that person saying, no, that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to vandalize property. We're here to have a peaceful protest. And so this is happening around the country. And it immediately dawned on me, we have to be very careful what was going on and perhaps even withdraw from the, from the protest because if the saboteurs are out there, their intent is to, is to redirect the narrative about what's going on. They say all people want to do is, is be destructive and so forth. And that's not this general sentiment that's, that's here. And this is happening all, you know, I, I was watching some of the uh, news put it. I'm seeing these people dressed in all black. I'm trying to figure out, I've never heard of a, a black rebellion, a black uprising, where people go home, put on all black, and come out to the rebellion. I've never heard of anything like that. This is happening in this rebellion. So we just have to be very careful when we see these scenes. These are not the people who originally come out there with legitimate grievances to articulate their, their opposition to what's happening. Some of these people are tagging along. They're, 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 they're uh, hitching a ride on black, con black, discon black discontent, but turning it away from peaceful to, to more of a violent expression. Because of course, a violent expression can generate outrage, a reaction, a response, a put down, if you will, if we take it from um, the president's perspective. You know, he's willing to bring in, you know, shoot people, dogs, as he said. So I, I wanted to make that point because this is an important point. I'll end it and so you can follow up this question about saboteurs, provocateurs, who are hitching rides on, and these are not black folk, or some of them can be black folk, but I, my suspicion is that a whole lot of them are not black folk. I suspect there are some anarchists, the white anarchists, the far left, they will hitch a ride on this thing, and the white supremacists who are conservatives out there, they will hitch a ride so they can sabotage this very legitimate and appropriate reaction on the part of black people across the country. It's just remarkable, James. I woke up I don't know what morning that was, and it just hit me. I think I saw my cousin had a Facebook post that downtown Columbus is on fire. I was like, what? And I'm from Ohio, so immediately my, I, you know, I perked up, and then I, you know, turned on the news, and it's all over the country. Every, all these major cities, Black folks just had enough. Just had enough. No, absolutely, and this is a very interesting point that you're making and this is an interesting part of the conversation that i think that we probably need to you know kind of unpack it um a little bit because you know this notion of peaceful protest uh this notion of provocateurs this notion of violence this notion of looting uh the counter discourses of those who are counter-revolutionary or counter radicals uh they would use uh leftist language like leftist uh they would invoke dr king um, you know, and they would also talk about outside agitators. And then there's this idea of property damage. And then there was like, you know, the avenue of pushing everybody's attention to focus on voting and things like this. I, I want to pull on this thread for, for a minute, um, particularly this connection between the looting violence and this, this idea of peaceful protesting. This notion of peaceful protesting is very interesting when you when you look at the history, particularly in the context of African people who are engaging in rebellion or, or resistance. I'm also thinking particularly about um, anti-slavery movements, the efforts of the white folk who were in the uh, abolitionist movement and how it wasn't until black folk entered that movement and made it more radical and called and made radical change, made radical uh, resistance against that particular uh, plantation or the aristocracy or the plantocracy as we call it. I'm thinking about this now and I'm also thinking about the fact that, you know, that a lot of those who intend to keep a certain order, particularly black folk, poor folk at the bottom, they also use weapons, of course, the police. When you mention the targeting of the police station. And I think that that is a very important point because 
that is a clear indication of a purveyor of, of, of state violence itself, particularly as an extension of the military um, that is move, you know, moving across the world. But let's, I mean, let's, let's really unpack this notion of, you know, how, if we're talking about provocateurs, are we looking at it in the context of they are sidetracking of those who are engaging in that are, pro, are promoting it to make it go a certain way based upon the notion of the ideas of violence or the notion of ideas of radicalness of the historical genealogy of black folk resisting? Or is this something else? You understand what I'm saying? It's, it, I mean, this notion between loot and violence and this, the push for peaceful protesting is very interesting because a lot of folk, particularly young folk, are like, well, hey, you know, we've been peaceful. And I think that's the interesting thing now because this narrative is kind of getting, getting muddled. It's getting, it's getting confused. It's, and we need to have a critical analysis on that particular so, notion. You know, one thing that, uh, to point out here is that Black urban rebellions have a, a shelf life. About three, four days usually maxes out the length of time of any Black urban rebellion. They're temporary movements, if, if you will. So the power, the power is packed within those two to three days that, that the rebellion lasts. After that, the rebels are, are, don't have that kind of power anymore because a rebellion can't last. You don't have, they don't have, you don't have sufficient resources, organization to make a urban rebellion last. So that's an important point to make. They, they're, they're temporary. They last for a short period of time. They are, they, they are an articulation of power on the part of the, rebel, of the rebels, even if it's just temporary. You know, because I can throw a stone through that window. I can, I can, I can damage that police station that's representative of those forces that that suppress on a regular basis. So that, that's an important point to, to and those who, and if, if I can harken back to the saboteurs, they know these are temporary, short-lived events, and you can sabotage them very easily by engaging in, especially the property damage. Burning, burning of stores and things like that. These are the most visible things that are happening. So I, you know, that was a concern that I have. I'm uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Pope. I just wanted to. That was where my mind was thinking. Just really watch out for these saboteurs because they're looking to have the meaning of these rebellions, the full meaning not being being considered. Meaning the political intent, the political substance of these. So you have people now talking about these things, and you see these. You see these where people are breaking windows, the way they're breaking windows. It just, it just seems, um, you know, I think about, and here's another point, James, about targeted violence. These rebellions are different from rebellions of yesteryear, right? I've never seen a, a Black urban rebellion that's multi-ethnic, uh, multi-racial. Usually in a black urban rebellion, white folk are steering clear because they are targets in, in rebellions. The Miami rebellion in 1980, whites were the targets. The Los Angeles rebellion following Rodney King, the uh, verdict, the whites were targets. I've never ever seen where whites are joining in the rebellion, looting, burning, vandalizing. I've never seen it before. So I don't know how that, how, you know, how they really interpret that. Uh, there's something very strange going on here. And maybe that's what lent itself to the kind of, what I, what I think sabotage going on with, the, with these movements all across the country. Whites are getting involved, all types of whites. We don't know who they are. And I've even heard people say, we need to start filming these people because they're clearly coming in where there isn't any violence and they're beginning to egg something on you know, even um, even supplying them with materials where they can engage, where they, where they can engage in violence. And you know, an uprising is a highly charged, emotionally charged event. So it's easy, it's easy to go with where the sway is going, you know, if you're out there on the streets because everybody's emotions are, are pretty are pretty high. So I just, I just wanted to sound the alarm again. I think it's really important to be on the lookout for this type of, uh, Activity. Let me say another thing, James, about I heard an interview. Tim Scott was being interviewed by Tim Scott, black senator from South Carolina. But at any rate, Tim Scott is being interviewed and he's being questioned about his meeting with the president. We are currently exploring 
Postmodernist Diversions of Black Rebellion with Dr. Daryl B. Harris. Daryl B. Harris is an associate professor and former chair of political science at Howard University. In 2014-2015, he was recipient of a Fulbright Distinguished Research Award to Nigeria. The scholarly focus of his teaching and research is the philosophical underpinnings of black political phenomena. His work combines methods of Afrocological and political analysis with the goal of advancing Afrocentric understandings of the world. He is author of The Logic of Black Rebellions, Postmodernist Diversions in African American Thought, as well as other chapters and articles. Daryl Harris has taught black politics and political theory courses at the University of Connecticut and is currently at Howard University, of which he has been since 2003. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Continue to enjoy the program. At any rate, Tim Scott is being interviewed and he's being questioned about his meeting with President Trump. And he said he had a good meeting with Trump and Trump cares and all this. And he said he got on Trump's case about his language, you know, about dogs and um, things like that. And then he said, well, you know, I, you know, we want a solution to this violence. We want a solution to police killings as well. And what we should do, this is what Tim Scott said. He said, we should, we should set up a commission. And, you know, my ears immediately perked up because I understand commissions having studied this phenomenon again. And people who have not studied this wouldn't immediately be alerted to this problem. The forming of commissions and committees to study a problem is a way is a way of saying we're not going to do anything about the problem. However, it does give the appearance something significant is being done. By, it's called commission politics. Politicians do it all the time. We got a big, big, big problem. Let's let's study it. And then you spend two, three years studying it, and you get a big report, and then the problem and the commission is not empowered to make policy. So nothing changes except you've, you've staved off the rebellion because now you got two, three year window. But if you make an announcement to people, hey, we're gonna study it. People, people, okay, yeah, that's cool. We got some action. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Congresswoman uh, Nancy Pelosi. She came to Howard University a couple years ago. And you know, this is Howard, right? So re the reparations, you know, reparations on people's lips. And so one of the first questions she got, and it was jam-packed in the auditorium at the School of Business, jam-packed. Media's there, you know, the university representatives are there, students, you know, they're ready to hammer her with reparations questions. First question, do you support reparations? And Nancy Pelosi gave a classic political response. She, she announced at Howard University, you know, I hear you all's concerns. We're, we're going we're gonna to put a committee together to study it. And right away, I said, man, she, she, she beat him. <laughs> she beat him. And that was it. So this business about Senator Scott trying to pretend like he's really genuinely concerned, he, he's really not. you got to read between the lines. This whole business about forming a commission is, is about nothing. It's their way of saying, we're not going to do anything about this problem. We'll look at it. Yeah, we'll put a couple experts, some high names on it. Yeah, we'll give you an impression that this is Trump talking. You know, he's calling out Antifa, and he's not calling out the white supremacist group. This is amazing stuff, right? The, the white supremacists who walk up in state house buildings fully armed. Not a word. Not a word. He's calls out Antifa. He's going to label them a terrorist organization. We got these white terrorists running around this country doing what they did to Arbery down in, down in Georgia. They're on police forces strong arming and killing killing us no 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 statement about that none no you're right and and there's a couple of points i wanted to make in response and also in relation to your statement is that one of the things that um i saw uh particularly as i was watching and also actually physically seeing you know going out and seeing a lot of the pro um in the area here in dc 
you know, one of the things I was struck with in, immediately as I started to see a lot of these particular, the burnings and a lot of these certain acts, I was thinking this contestation between white rage and black suffering, right? Um, yeah. You know, this idea that, you know, there is, a, we're in the middle of a pandemic, millions of people are losing their jobs, uh, the economy, there's so and so much uncertainty. And so, yeah, and I'm also thinking particularly back during the uh, Occupy movements, when a lot of folk were hit, a lot of the white middle class were hit with a, a number of the economic downturn and they lost their jobs and so they were sitting out. But black folk um, didn't participate as much uh, in mass into that because it was because of the mission, because of the ideas and because of the, it, it did not seem to have any type of organized effort. I wanted to make a, a historical mm-hmm. note here is that when we talk about the multiracial aspect of um, resistance, particularly here in the settler nation of the United States, we can't forget Bacon's Rebellion, but also we can't forget John Brown and those other instances sure. that you had a multi uh, so-called racial or a multi-pronged effort of folk who were actually participating in resistance alongside Black people, but also the idea that you had poor folk African descended folk and other folks. So there are some historical precedents here that I think that those who are in power have a longer historical memory than those of us um, who are actually either participating or engaged in a lot of these <laughs> political activities. And I think that that's important. That's one point. And, and I really want to transition into, you know, some of the things that are prohibiting us, particularly Black folk, to actually have a critical analysis for a sustained movement. Uh, yeah, one right. of the things that I was very interested in um, is also the the idea of sustainability of movements. And I wanted to make a point that I think, and you can correct me if I'm reading this wrong, particularly in the uh, connection when I mentioned earlier about looting violence and then the peaceful protest when I was talking about that a few minutes ago, is that what I'm hearing you say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we have to be wary of those particular uh, provocateurs because what happens is Black folk ability to organize a longer struggle is now inhibited if it's raised to the level of such a aggressive state that the state literally smashes it down before it actually is able to actually pick up momentum for for sustainability. And I don't, is that what you're saying of of why we should be very, very careful, these provocateurs and why that is so dangerous because the ability to formulate a longer sustained resistance can be. Yeah, um, yeah, Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And that's a good, important point. And, you know, I was thinking about this, and it doesn't even have to be that extreme. So I'm thinking about this question of, the questions you're posing are crystallized around the question of ideology. What direction are we going to travel to improve our situation? That's partly an ideological question, but it's also partly a theoretical meaning. How do we understand our circumstances? Now, I I, am... I'm of the opinion right now that, uh, and I'm thinking about Nick Nelson's book, Black Atlantic Politics, where he he makes the observation. He says, the question, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, the question, uh, this is William E. Nelson's book, Black Atlantic Politics. It is a comparative study of Black politics in England and Black politics in the U.S. And he raises, and this is when the whole postmodernism discussion was raging. Black postmodernists were pushing their position of uh, anti-culture, anti-nation, anti-blackness kind of posture. He made the observation that he's in that book, he said, uh, the question is not what you are influenced by. All of us have influences coming from various, various places. He said, the question really is, well, who is your primary significant other? You know, what are you primarily wedded to? What is, this, what is the center of your consciousness? What is the core of your consciousness? That's really what he's, what he's getting at. Is blackness at the core of your consciousness or is something else at the core of your consciousness? consciousness. That's how I interpret, partly how I interpret was how we should think of these things. So my view is that to the extent that these expressions, whether it's postmodernism or intersectionality or what I call these these, and this is in line with the postmodernist position, even though they may not technically call themselves postmodernists, 
But those who argue for like a contingency position, meaning whatever is affecting me at this moment, that's how I will mobilize, that's how I will organize. Well, the problem with that, the problem is that you don't, you don't get any, the problem is not that that's not practic practicable sometimes, it is. But the question of sustainability for the black movement is a different question. That's not gonna, that's not gonna, that type of, mo those type of mobilization, temporary, mobilizations are temporary. After the mobilization is over, people disperse and go back home. What holds movements together? Organized center. What provides direction? Some, something that people are wedded to together. So when we make these arguments about blackness should serve that role, all of a sudden you get opposition. You get opposition from the postmodernists, you get opposition from the intersectionality people. Everybody's opposed to blackness being at the, at the center of black identity. This is remarkable stuff. Everything else could be at the center of black identity, but not, but not who you are. I was thinking about this you know, fairly recently because I'm working on a project to critique uh, of this. And, and this is the other pro problem that comes from this. These same people who say, oh, you can't, you know, blackness can't be the primary identity marker. These are the same people who will use, who will appropriate blackness. But they appropriate blackness on two levels, Jay. One, on the skin color, meaning phenotype, and two, on what I call expressive culture, meaning music, song, and dance. And let me give an example, and I, and I, and I hope you don't mind me singling out. Maybe I shouldn't single them out by name, but uh, Dyson is a very good one, if you will, if I may. And this is not like me trying to throw stones at him, just to make the point. It's a critique. Okay. If you see a presentation uh, of his, he uh, liberally appropriates aspects of Black expressive culture in order to communicate to his audience, primarily Black audience. And he especially, he's especially good with rapping, right? So uh, he may take, you know, some lines from a prominent rapper and he'll, he'll rap to the, his audience. So he's using Blackness, the aspect of Blackness, for his program, for what he does. And that's him tapping into music, song, and dance, the way Black people express themselves. He's good at it. All Black preachers are good at, are good at it. Successful preachers know how to do this. They reach into black, black forms of expression. And then he'll turn around and at the same time say, but hold on, there's certain aspects of Blackness we can't, we can't have, like unity, especially unity. And unity is at the core. If you don't have unity, you don't have, you don't have the sustained movement we're talking about. You're done. So these postmodernist types, these intersectionality types, they're out there arguing against Black unity. Literally arguing against Black unity. And expect to have a sustained Black movement is impossible. So I've been not, and this has been, this has been especially a big problem in the post, really in the 21st century. In the 1990s, moving forward. It, uh, these types, and they're all elites. These aren't the black masses. Black masses don't have time for talking about intersectionality. Black masses don't have time to talk about postmodernism. It's ridiculous. There's no such thing as postmodernism post -modernism among the black masses. They, they laugh at you. All, all they know is blackness. All we know is being black. What are you talking about? Okay? And, and by the way, these same people will come running back to blackness once they start experiencing the this, this stuff that we see experience, you know, that we experience in this country. It always happens. <clears throat> and, but it's the black elite. And I have a more critical observation because as you know, James, the way I, I believe that core values are central to political expression. I mean, when we say core values, we mean culture, the centrality of culture, culture is at the center of this thing. And our black intellectual class at they have not um, have not approached explaining black political phenomena in that manner, uh, and so if we take it at that level, for me, it's at the level of core values. So I go even deeper. So as you know, for me, it's the idea of the individual or the community. Is one of those ideas are going to prevail? One is a European idea. One is an African value, and we're not talking about being rigid talking about having an idea and making this idea work for the way we organize ourselves and the way we develop ourselves and the way we act 
And so you you cannot sustain you will not sustain if people if people are walking around saying, you know, my identity is fluid. One week I could be operating on a on a nationality identity. The next week I could be operating on a racial identity. The week after that I could be operating on a class identity. The week after that, if you're fluid like that, there's no there's no there's nothing there's no there's nothing cohesive ideologically and theoretically that can hold people together. That's the problem. I just wanted to, uh, to cut in here because um, you're, making, you're making some arguments. And of course, when people are going to be listening to this, I mean, you, you are uh, providing a, a, a deeper or actually pushing us to think deeply and more critically about these notions or these frames such as intersectionality and neoliberalism and this idea of postmodernism. And you're actually talking particularly at a very, very philosophical uh, uh, level. You mentioned theory, you mentioned core values as being important, and, and, you are, and you are absolutely correct as far as my interest in having these conversations and in having any conversation, um, particularly in public or thinking black out loud in public on this particular platform, is really to understand what is it that we need, are the tools that we need to push beyond the aesthetics of what we call blackness. So what I'm actually hearing you say is actually an argument that John Henry Clark made. We need to move to a center. We need to center it in what he would call Africana. Du Bois uh, went to Ghana and Nkrumah to actually develop this, this concept, this idea of Africana. Um, yeah. And what it's doing, this is Africana concept, is also a contradiction or a, a not a response, but an actual antithesis of uh, what we would call uh, postmodernists. I mean, because the ideas that are relevant there are these elements that connect people, humanity. Indiv- individualism is a contradiction of collectivism, right. and also these. It also um, unmasks these these notions of that there is individual. That individualism is a a construct upon which we can build, or liberalism is a construct because they have a specific historical specificity to them. They're born out of the experiences of Europe and the creation of the right. nation state. Right. And one of the things that I wanted to I wanted to kind of push on is that talk a little bit more. Let's unpack your argument here because people are going to be listening to this. They're going to hear you say the intersectionality. They're going to hear you say these things and they're going to get unless they're listening to you and also um, have read or, 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 or we can point to Charles Mills, racial contract, certain articles or certain things that we can point to to kind of get people to understand the argument that you're making is that what you're saying is that we need to push beyond these, these notions of modernity, these notions of that were gifted to us, these notions of private property, these notions of individual. And also what you're saying too is that there is a self-critique here that Black intellectuals, uh, Black folk, um, that are on the ground that have to have themselves because you have a lot of black folk who are who are actually saying the same things that those i mean you get killer mike uh, who makes this statement and everybody celebrates it. he has kill your masters on his shirt when he's giving this statement but everything that he's saying is a protect the property of the capitalist class right so he's everything he's saying is that listen that we have to be able to critique and listen at a deeper level as opposed yeah. to just the aesthetic and just the emotional movement right. That right. people make towards us. Right. Unpack your argument a little bit more. Talk about what postmodernism, as you you are actually talking about, unpack that, and then let's move forward from there. Because I think you're making a point that everyone needs to understand. So, you know, the, the sort of postmodern uh, position is that there is no center, there is no ultimate theory, uh, there is no clear presentation. Everything is fluid. One cannot put one's finger on a clear meaning to phenomena. Uncertainty abounds. And as such, human beings don't have like one place where they stand. There's no historical, cultural, nationality position that any human being stands. We're all fluid. That's the essence of the postmodernist idea. Fluidity being bound to ambiguity, uncertainty. These are the calling, calling words of, of postmodernism. Now, the postmodernist says we should have that as a political posture, uncertainty, fluidity, 
this notion of uh, contingency that I mentioned earlier, that you could, you could be operating on different identities depending on the day of the week, if you will. And so the criticism that I level, in a, my general criticism is that, not to say that you don't have these various contradictions going on in American society. The question is how should we organize ourselves to uh, address the subordination that we find ourselves in? So my argument is that we had, we had, there has to be something cohesive that people can stand, a space that people can stand in. And that cohesiveness really is observed out of one's historical and cultural experiences, what we might call, and, and what might come out of that is this notion of a worldview. The worldview is to suggest that there's a philosophical foundation on which, on which all peoples uh, evolve out of. And one could make the same uh, observation regarding black experience. So when I say, how do we define, so black is a metaphor for history and culture. And in this history and culture, one can observe the evolution of values and ideas and concepts. That's where we begin. So, so this notion of black or blackness indicates this big experience. And in that experience, we can observe values, ideas, and concepts. Those values, ideas, and concepts, I would argue should, should make up the building blocks for the types of ideolo ideologies and theories that we develop. And then ultimately for the kind of structures that we put together, institutions that we put together, organizations that we put together. We, sh we should have organizations, institutions that have as their mission to uh, obviously black liberation, black empowerment, the empowerment of black people, irrespective of our individuality. I think what has transpired, unfortunately, James, is that we confuse individuality with individualism. Individualism is really a byproduct of uh, European liberalism where the individual is at the center of everything. Individuality, everybody has it, irrespective of where you live on the planet. You just gotta come to the earth via a, you know, via a womb, and you have individuality. The fact that you, you, everybody has that. And they're not the same. Individualism is about self being self-absorbed. There's this whole notion of being self-interested outweighs everything else. That's individualism and not individuality. They may share aspects like this notion of, you know, will, you know, individual will, individual initiative. Of course, they share those things, but then it goes over the line when you talk about being self explored So my concern about these more fashionable ideas that are out there, postmodernism being one of them, and I believe these others are sort of a follow-up to postmodernism. They don't call themselves postmodern, but they, they essentially say the same thing. And that is that they are, ge they are genuinely opposed to blackness being the primary identity marker for black people. And I would argue even more, James, is that some of them are even, they appropriate blackness. So you have people say, well, you know, this should be black politics. And then you ask them, well, well based on what? It's based on only phenotype, skin color. That's only part part of the ex, the part of the, uh, the explanation. We can't take skin color alone as an indicator of black politics, unless the way I divide it up to make to, so people can make sense of what's going on. You have black politics with the uppercase P, black politics with lowercase P. Black politics with the lowercase P would capture all of that, meaning it's all political thought, all political behavior by anybody whose phenotype is black. You know who who goes the way we define it in the U.S irrespective of quality, irrespective of ideology. So Clarence Thomas is outrageous sellout behavior all the way to revolutionary black. That's black politics with a lowercase p. But when we start talking about black politics with an uppercase p, we start talking about types of things, types of concerns you have, uh, theoretical concerns, philosophical concerns. How do we how do we understand this phenomenon? Can we really, and then we can even so even further it says what Clarence Thomas does is not black politics, it's white politics in black face. That's so that's what the black politics with the uppercase P does. Tragically, I think, James, what we what we have going on among the new, newly minted black PhDs who are desperate to do black politics, who never studied black politics. Oh, by the way, they haven't they haven't studied Mac Jones. They haven't studied these people. 
and they a lot of them want in on black politics only on the basis of phenotype. And perhaps that second category I mentioned uh, on expressive culture, they're not, they're not for philosophical blackness, they're not for political blackness. Oh, no, 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 we, we will fight against that. Some of the people I mentioned to you, they fight vehemently against philosophical blackness, political blackness. Then you ask them, well, what, what? if you take the Afrocentric position, which I do, as you know, and Afrocentricity raises the question or poses the question or makes the observation, everybody stands somewhere. There's no anti-place. You stand in some history, some, some culture. Do you stand in your own history and culture? Do you stand in somebody else's history and culture? Those, that history and culture is, is defined by critical concerns and positions that should be predictable based on the history and culture. So Clarence Thomas, whose phenotype is clearly black, right, takes positions that are antithetical to black liberation, what should we call that person? Uh, yes, the person is engaged in black political expression because his phenotype is black. But when we put when we when we, when we critique it using the uppercase P, our critique is se severe, and we can draw the conclu conclusion of what he's really practicing is white power. When you really tease it all out, because his positions, his interests are reflective of white interests and not black interests. So I wanted to make that point, and this is where. And it's increasingly become a, becoming a problem, I think, James, because I think the black postmodernists and the intersectionality types, these are black elites. We have to remember that. And, they're all, and they are positioning themselves for upward mobility. So part of their postmodern posture is for upward mobility for themselves and perhaps for the particular contingency that they may be a part of. And here you have, the, again, the encroachment on, on blackness happening all over, all over the academy. You know, people like, hey, you know, move over. This is now black politics. No, no, this is now black politics. And then you end up not having black politics at all. And so I think those of us who, and this is something that, uh, and I'll uh, stop on this point, James, I think a very important point, and I hearken uh, one of the, uh, Call on Mac Jones here, who's been most consistent in his career, admonishing us to develop perspective that emerges out of our, our own worldview, a black worldview. And the failure to do it, he made this observation long back in the early 70s, failure to do this means that we will continue to operate on, on the default worldview, which is the white worldview. That's where most, I would argue, most black political scientists, I'm not talking about white political scientists, they, you know, they're already, they're white political scientists. Most black political scientists continue to operate on that default position, the white worldview. And they, yet they will fight you tooth and nail and say what they do is black politics only because their subject matter is black. And I'm saying to you again, the fact that your subject matter is black by itself should not be sufficient to call it black politics. It should also be that you're using those values, ideas, and concepts that evolve out of Black people's experience. If you are using those and applying them to whatever phenomenon you study, especially if it's Black phenomena, whether it's individuals, organizations, movements, then you're doing, you're doing Black politics because you're taking the tools uh, that evolve out of Black people's experience and applying it to Black phenomena. So values, ideas, and concepts that evolve out of Black people's experience should be applied to Black people. And so how do we know this? It was, people will fight back and say, oh, no, Black people don't have values, ideas. And I said, yes, we do. And I, you have to prove it to them. And even if I just took, not even our pre-Western hemisphere experience, even if I just took, let's just take 1619 to the present. 1619 is the, the year represented by those 20 Africans who were brought to Jamestown, Virginia, representing the beginning of our sojourn in North America. If you just take 1619 to where we're at right now, and if we think of 1619 to the present, like if we think of a river metaphor, like this is a river of struggle, and this river is the people, but also, and the river is the movement, the Black Freedom Movement. All rivers have tributaries. A river, a river can't move forward unless there are other waters making their contribution to that river so that river can press forward 
to its ultimate destination, the sea or the ocean. Those rivers are tributaries. Well, the Black movement has tributaries. Tributaries like Harry Tubman or Ida B. Wells or Martin Luther King. Those are tribu tributaries to the Black movement, dumping their waters into, into, the, into the, the larger river. Tributaries are also organizations. When the big or NAACP or Urban League, for example, just to name something that people would immediately recognize. So tributaries are also the many movements, anti-slavery movement, anti-lynching movement, black power movement. These are many movements. They are tributaries though, contributing to the, to the black freedom movement. That's how we know. And what's even more, uh, and, and, uh, and check this out, in all that activity, we can observe values, freedom, self-determination, self-autonomy, social justice, equality, these values being articulated and fought for throughout this whole experience. Those are the values, ideas, and concept, concepts of Black experience. Those are the values, ideas, and concepts that we use when we do our critical analysis of Black phenomena, whether it's individuals, movements, or organizations. We don't have to look outside of ourselves. Our own experience is comprised of values, ideas, and concepts. It's up to us to take those values, ideas, and concepts and apply them when we explain or describe or critique our own experiences, whether they're individuals, movements, organizations, and so forth. That's, what, that's, that's Black politics. If I am borrowing tools from the European experience, I'm not, in my estimation, I'm not doing Black politics. I'm studying Black people, but I'm not using those tools that come out of Black experience to make my observations, to draw my conclusions, and so forth. So to kind of encapsulate this um, and to bring this conversation, you know, obviously we've got to move to a closing of this conversation. One of the things I wanted to make sure that we, we highlight, uh, particularly in, in, in your response, and I, I want to make sure that we understand, I mean, what you're talking about, of course, you're a Black political scientist and you're looking at this, but also this, say, this is the problem with Africana studies as a whole, um, is the removal of the political aspect out of, polit out of Africana studies, those who study politics, those who study politics, not necessarily centered on a European um, uh, uh, center, but looking at it through the experiences of the African world, is that once you started to remove a lot of those particular people outside, out of those departments, out, outside of being able to produce uh, knowledge is that what you have is literature and what you have is this historical instance and that Africana studies has moved into this space that we're actually talking about that black politics quickly moved into uh, being impotent, so to speak, being a place of not having any center and not even having any grounding and just being more descriptive as opposed to actually okay. providing a, um, a prescriptions or, or, or remedies within which black people uh, African people have always, but also another component of this is that when you talk about tributaries, I think it's important particularly to talk about the African world, talk about our uh, the Maroon communities, talk about uh, yes, Nascimento yes, in Brazil, talk about Sankora, talk about Nkrumah, talk about um, Winnie Mandela as being tributaries to this aspect of resistance. And so this also leads me to understanding and to really give our listeners a more textured, even we can, even mm -hmm. everything you said can be textured when you talked about the fluidity and the, and, and the, the, you know, the clear meaning of phenomena, uh, this idea that most people would say, well, Black are many things. Black is, black is right. multi, this, right. that, and this. Right. So that's their response, right. this neoliberal, uh, well, modernist response. And, and let me just say this last thing is that it also looks, it also even looks like this postmodern response also looks like a Black person who is literally faced with racism yeah. actions to actually explain and say, well, I don't know if they're racist because I don't know their heart. I don't know. But it was <laughs> clearly a, a racist act for this. This, that, this is what we're talking about, this idea of not having a clear center yeah. and being stripped. Yeah. And these are yeah. fine lines that we do. These are fine yeah. lines. I'm sorry. These are fine lines that we tread particularly yeah, yeah. in this postmodernist and this, this, this yeah. fracturing. It, it, makes it, it makes it totally impossible. I mean, we start <laughs> distrusting one another. We can't organize with one another. Ego gets in the way. All these things get in the way because we refuse to have, we refuse to operate out of a center, a philosophical center, if you will. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and it could be a number of things, James. I suspect um, a fear, fear, 
it's like, you know, it's like uh, because it's really about us declaring our intellectual freedom. And just like any effort at freeing yourself, you, uh, you got to free yourself from uh, that which is enslaving you. And the last frontier, if you will, and uh, giants have said this, winning our intellectual freedom. That's the, that's the biggest hurdle. And, and it's even more of a challenge among the intellectual class because we have more to lose for breaking free. We have careers and conferences and these types of things to worry about, right? Especially if you're at a white institution. And it doesn't mean you can't do these things. It's just a major, major, major challenge. And it's what it has proven, I would argue, it has proven to be really profitable to be a postmodernist type these days because you're seen as one bucking, bucking the, the black tide, if you will. And if you're good at it, you will be literally elevated and celebrated as, you know, this is the new, this is the new black politics, if you will. This is the new black expression, black intellectual expression. But postmodernism goes nowhere. It goes absolutely nowhere. It goes nowhere except for the individual. And, and those are the types of things, even though people are not calling themselves postmodernists right now, that's that sentiment that's really out there. And blackness, I would argue, is, is, is being used. I, I, there's this writer, you may know him. He goes by the name of Toure. Uh, he used to be a commentator on like one of the MSNBC or something like that. One of these cultural commentators. He wrote a book, like a more popular type book. I think he's like a journalist type. Called post, and he uses this phrase called postmodern blackness. No, 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 I'm sorry. He doesn't even use the term postmodern. I'm sorry. He calls it, in, was it it's either individualist blackness or blackness individualist, something like that. He's, he's mixing the two, blackness and individualist. I'm like, this, this is an oxymoron. They don't, blackness, blackness signifies groupness. It doesn't signify individual. It, in the, in the, we say blackness, we're insinuating it's more than just one individual. But here you have a postmodernist type trying to use blackness to elevate their own personal careers. This is what Mike Ware Dyson does. I should stop calling him out like this because I don't want him to come off like I'm singling him out. I just wanted to make the point about the way black postmodernists are using black culture to promote their individual programs, the individual career and, and uh, advancements. And it's, it's really a shame, if you will, because it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's just like the movie moguls or the, the, uh, the uh, music, music moguls who use black culture to enrich themselves. And that's all it, be, it becomes, it becomes a show. That's all it becomes. There's no political substance to it. In fact, it might even, it might even suppress political consciousness because it's, because all it is is fun and, you know, shucking and jiving, right? This is what some of our black intellectuals are participating in. And you know, yeah, so, uh, and it's very, very dangerous, man. And, um, and we got to fight them back. I, I, I'm of the opinion, and intellectually, that is, uh, we got to push back because that's, won't, it won't take us anywhere. It won't take us anywhere. And that's why this, this you mentioned theoretical, um, you mentioned, you know, very early philosophical. And I also wanted to make the point to our listeners before we close is that, you know, the idea we're, we're using blackness and we, and um, you explained it before. I want, to, want folk to know that they can go back and listen to what you're talking about within the context of this idea of blackness. We're talking about the values, the morals, the concepts that create a philosophical worldview. Of, of of an experience because you know I want me I want folk and I just want to highlight that again, um, but also that's the reason why this period becomes very important because what we're at now, what we're really at, what we where we really are at this particular point in our historical um, epoch is, mm-hmm. you know the the practice of resistance has now reached the level that we have to refine and also solidify the forward movement being centered on what, who we are in relation to each other, but also in relation to nature and the universe itself, because society literally is crumbling on itself. European modernity is in its self-destructive phase. And if we're not careful, uh, everyone will be pulled down into that. 
um, and and particularly those and and you mentioned um, Eric Dyson and you mentioned that name, but we can really say uh, Van Jones. We can really say other folk, oh, uh, sure. and other intellectuals, and including intellectuals who call, so called uh, so called a radical. When you really peel yeah. back right. what they're saying, what they're really saying is actually contradictory notions right. that right. keep us standing in place, and then we're right. still right. having these same conversations over and over and right. over right. again. Because of the language, the worldview, the ideas are centered not upon right. the Africana world or Africana right. systems of forms of knowledge, but it's centered upon European um, ideas. And I'll, right. let, I'll give you this closing remark and then we'll put a pin in it because, again, as we move forward, we'll, get, we'll have this conversation uh, again. Okay. But you can close well, really, with any, any comments okay. to that. No, I appreciate um, that. Uh, the last observation you made is very important. You know, and you just sort of watch. I was listening to, because now that this re the rebellions have been happening, a lot of talking heads who used to be around are now being called back up. Uh, Cornel West is one of them. I was listening to him. It just like, it sounded so old to me. Not him sounding old, but the argument. I, and, it, and, it, and it was, it was a nowhere argument. It just, it's like, it's just rhetoric about, you know, the, the hyper capitalist corporate class. And it was like a bunch of slogans. And it's like, that's, that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is, yes, we should identify the problems with the contradictions that we got to fight against. But you still got to have a center that you're operating out of. And if you don't have a center, if you're not wedded to something, you are suspended in air, as Sheikh Antadia said. You're suspended in air. If you don't have a philosophical base that you're standing on that represents the historical experience of your people, and we are people. And th this is the other thing, uh, James. These same types will be running around saying, "Oh, there's no such thing as black peoplehood." This is like this is like the most ridiculous things that you could be saying out here. And of course, we get picked off by everybody else who's well organized, as you know, They're well organized. They know what they want, and we just we just we help them get what they want. And, and then we're out here, you see with like, these rebellions, you got all kind of interlopers coming along. Um, and, and, but they're redefining the rebellion because they want to clash, they want to have clashes with the police. They don't have the confrontations that we have on a, on a day to day basis, but here they come out of the woodwork. Oh, let's go bust some windows up and sabotage the black movement. This, this is what I think is going on and we should be I know I veered off a little bit, but I'm hoping that we are very careful in the coming days that we don't get caught out here and then everything's get, everything is redefined because the saboteurs have been successful at you know, hijacking our grief and, uh, and our attempt to get this problem, problem addressed and give Trump all the good reason to declare martial law and have military forces in these cities, man. And then you, and then you got a total disaster on your hands. Because the other thing is, these young people, they're, uh, they're not going for it, man. They have decided, we, 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 this is coming to an end. Our parents had to go through it. Our grandparents, we ain't going through this. We, 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 we fight. So I'm happy to see that spirit happening. I'm just very, even though I know there are two things, I'll end on this, James. There are two things regarding the rebellion that's going on. One, the legitimate targeted expression, and I use the police station as my example, and then you have the saboteurs out here. They, they've got on board, man. And they're, they're, they're all over. They're all over the country. It's sabotaging. Wherever black folk are amassing, saboteurs are coming. And before you can even realize what's happening, they're jumping out of their cars. They're spray painting buildings. They're throwing urine, filled, you know, uh, bottles filled with urine. At, they're, doing, they're creating a confrontation. So, so the tear gas can start flowing and, and, and all of that. So I just, I'm just hoping... Uh, you know, the spontaneity, maybe we, you know, I was, I was even thinking today, you know, we should, we should hold off for a day or two going out in the streets to get a handle on these saboteurs because they, they're popping up. They just pop it up. And I think they're the right wingers out here and the, and the, and the, uh, anarch, the white anarchists who are look, who just, they look, they pray for these type of scenarios. So they ain't gonna go out there on their own, James. We jump on the black people are out there. Let's go out there now and busted up some property, blaming on the black people, right? Because they all, they dressed up in all black, from head to toe, all black, jumping out of vans and jumping back in the van. You know that ain't us. 
that ain't that ain't the brothers, right? <laughs> well, listen, Daryl. I mean, you know, we we had the Boston Tea Party, right? So they dressed up in Native Americans <laughs> uh, for a particular purpose. Put a pin in it on that because again, yeah. there's more that needs to be discussed because this con- right. you know you know this contestation, particularly violent protest and and the idea yeah. of the nation state and crumbling and what is the role and responsibility of black folk in reconstructing society. Uh, our, our constructing a maroon community, as I would say, so I'm really, really interested in our ancestors who were maroons and literally moving, uh, I'm sorry, literally constructing societies outside of the dominant structure. Mm-hmm. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Yes, um, indeed. And we definitely will be in conversation again. Um, maybe next time we'll definitely have maybe a panel or something. Thank you again okay. for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you, fam. Yes, indeed. That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email Project at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Mouizu Mutali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funda Ngunda, senior research, content contributor, and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior researcher and content contributor and production associate, Dr. Josh Myers, associate producer and content contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, technology advisor is Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology, and creative director is Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC NPR affiliate and broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Shows are archived weekly on SoundCloud. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent.